what's going on? This is David Chen, and you're on another edition of Panamax Podcast, New York Weekly's number one podcast. And you guys, we are here in season three, right before Halloween, and we have my good friend, Rosette. How are you doing? Good. How are you? So let's tell everyone how we met and a little bit about you and, and go from there. I'll tell you my story. We had the ESPYs party in Los yes. Angeles that I was hosting with Matt Barnes, right? Yes. We got all big and is up in smoke, right? And we had our friend, our mutual friend Shelby was there and a couple of people. And you had come up with her and we had started talking, met and stayed friends, right? Yes. And it was crazy because that was the first time I had hosted a party in LA at that magnitude. Oh, wow. It was an amazing party too. You had all these fancy cars. That I, I had to, it was, it was pretty cool because it was at the Porsche experience and it was a show yeah. to classic college for putting this up. And I know we had, we had a bunch of people there and it's going from there. That's when we met like Donovan Card and all the, the, those big stars and you. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing about that was not knowing what to go into it, not knowing as you're a host, you know, coming from El Paso, a small town, you know, basically nobody from nowhere and going to the big city lights of, of LA and the hopes and dreams and to be with a guy that you've seen on TV and to meet all these celebrities and blue check mark people coming in like yourself and hosting it is rather intimidating because you almost have to act like you deserve to be there. Right. Uh, but you did a great job because I thought you were very comfortable. So damn, well, I appreciate that. Cause you know, that was one thing that we had to do. And I remember we did that gaming experience. I remember you walking in and, and we started talking going from there and then going from and, and continue being friends. And now like, I don't even know this. You're an excellent singer. Like you're a great singer. You did Rihanna what the other day? I did do a Rihanna cover the a couple of days ago. Yes. So tell us yes. a little about your music career and how you kind of got into it, and also the skit side of things as well. Okay. Yeah. So um, I I met you, and you know what? The first thing I have to say, your wife is stunning. Oh my god! Like I have like what the heck? she's like poison ivy on steroids. Oh man, like, she 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 actually was poison ivy two years ago. <laughs> My I mean, <laughs> she, I mean, like, I'm just saying that she's so beautiful. I remember seeing her and I was like, oh my God, I thought she was some kind of superstar. And then I was like, oh, wow, you guys looked amazing together. But okay. Yeah. Thank I remember you. that. Cause Shelby and Lindsay had taken me with Casey Bennett. We were all there with you. Right. Um, yeah. So it was an amazing time. So I'm an OG in music. Uh, I was doing music before IG before, you know, uh, it was all big and stuff. A lot of people tell me I was born in the, or my music was in the wrong era because it was before IG. So I was signed when I was 14 years old to BMG wow. in Canada. And then I had a national, like a national song, a couple of number ones in Canada. And then I got as big as I could in Canada and I won a couple of awards. And then I was like, you know, I'm going to make the move to LA. Uh, I ended up getting signed to Sony Ultra in New York City. Uh, and then I, I, before that, I did a song with Timbaland. I wrote for Britney Spears and Madonna and just, um, this was all before IG. So and, when you say, uh, when you say all before IG, that's, that's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. So you I got my blue check mark like that because I'm like an old OG. I didn't, I woke up and I was like, oh. Thanks, Instagram. <laughs> Damn, that's amazing. So wait for my yeah. Instagram, just so you guys know. As, as you're putting that together, and you you wrote for Britney, right? You come yes. from Canada, and you're putting this through. You know, I don't think people realize how hard it is in the industry. It's extremely hard, especially being a woman. Um, a big reason why I backed off was because, um, of, you know, before then, we didn't have the Me Too movement. And a lot of that stuff was happening. And, and I was... I had to pick and choose between my moral, like, you know, mental compass wow. or doing the things that everybody else is doing. And I decided uh, I'm just going to go with my moral a compass and back away from it because I just didn't want to do those things. That is the hardest journey I think anyone doesn't understand. I don't care if you're an athlete, a musician, an entrepreneur as a human being. Yeah. There are many, many times, right? You're stuck. You came up from a mm -hmm. number one hit, right? You've done all these things, written these big things, and yet numerous number one, numerous, numerous. Number one hits, right? Numerous yeah. number one hits, right? Let's let's talk about the numerous number one hits that you hit. Which ones were they? I had um, amnesia was uh, number one in different territories around the world. Damn, like, girl, 
huge in Australia, huge in Poland, massive in my own country, Canada, um, you know, pretty good in the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Um, it's huge. I had like the video had about, well, now it has 12 million views, but that was back in the way, back in the day. Uh, yeah. And then I had a number one nationally in Canada called crush. And then I had another top five it, called, uh Oh, and then I had another top five in Germany, France, and Europe uh, called Fire. Like I have a lot of songs and a lot of music videos. And yeah, like it's just, it was, I love music for music, but it started beca becoming political. So, yeah. and you got to stay positive. I'm a woman and I didn't have anybody. Like I didn't have a team, you know, I, didn't, I managed myself. I was very independent. So, yeah. It, 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 it's humbling because I don't think a lot of people understand when, when you leave as a number one from a territory, most people are very comfortable, right? Like yeah. who the hell doesn't want to be comfortable? Who the hell doesn't want to just live and bask in their glory and be the cool guy, right? But yep. I, a lot of people develop high school quarterback syndrome. Nothing to my high school quarterback friends. I love you guys all to death. But yep. if they don't make it to the next level, they almost want to stay and entrench them there because it makes it easier. Where you, you're hitting these number one moves and, and you're out and you're running about and you're coming to the U.S. and you're writing bigger hits and bigger, 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 bigger things. And now you're faced with a moral dilemma challenge. Yeah. The hardest part is is when you're making that decision. And, let's, yep. and the, the discretion is everything I work for has come to this moment. Everyone mm -hmm. else is doing it. Yep. For me to get there, I could do it. But mm -hmm. the long-term effects is if I do it, then I will yep. be known as that person and I have to yep. continue to do that. So that yep. that's the same thing if you're an athlete and 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 you're an agent and you end up paying that athlete money and that athlete, and that only relationship is that money relationship, right? And yep. it was a, a very hard dilemma. And and how do you, like how, how I, I can never understand how people would never just moral up. Right. And just be like, dude, this is not something I want to do. There are no morals in the industry. Let me just tell you that right now. I mean, and oh. I, 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 it was, I was depressed. They shelved me because I didn't want to do certain things, you know, that involved to be sexual. I was shelved. I was shelved for years. And then I'm um, finally, when it was enough to destroy my career to the point where I had nothing coming out, they let me go. Cause I kept begging them to let me go. But while they were shelving me, Jeez. that's when I wrote, that's when I wrote the song for Britney Spears. Cause I figured out another way. And I said, okay, well, if you guys won't let me put songs out, well, I can write songs. Right. And so like, you know, and it was like a challenge and you know, you, you, you know, I'm human. So I was really frustrated. Cause yeah, you come from having like, one birthday party where like there's 4,000 people there and you're like, wow, you're so loved. You're at the top of your game. And then two years later, only four people come to your birthday party. Cause like you have no songs out, you know, you're as only as big as, an, as, as an important as your song is your next hit single. That's what I learned. And so I just was like, I don't want to really be in this kind of situation for the rest of my life. Cause it's always chasing something. You know, a lot of young people, young women, young men are going to hear exactly what you just talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. And that mental battle. And you're not talking about a day to day battle. You're talking about a every single every hour when you think about a battle when things come up and go from there. The yep. mental attitude is so important because your morales have to leave it right when people are hitting those higher numbers and you know you're just as good if not better. And the numbers yep. are less and less and less and less. Now you realize the game is not based on your ability of what you have. It's who you know what you're willing to do. And that's Politics. a very scary thing, right? So and that I, is true. I do that. It's true. I mean, there's people like Jesse Reyes, like she finally, you know, admitted to what happened with her. A lot of people, you know, I've I've spoken to some of the most influential artists in the world, and I sat down and I talked to them, and they've been through it. And this was like in the '90s and the '80s, and I was just like, really, you know, and, and to just see these really strong, influential people have to do things that were morally not just so they could have what they, it's like, what do you love more? And at that moment, as a woman, I just was like, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could live with it. And that's why you see a lot of people in the industry with like, you know, like alcoholism or drug abuse or something to numb the pain. And, and I just thought, I don't want to go that route. I think I can find happiness another way. I, I love that. And, 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 you know, happiness will last forever. Right. 
nothing else yep. forever. And you thought about the core, the, the moral angles that exist and it made it work. And as, as it's going through, you said you started changing, you started doing the writing and you found your way out of it, right? You started writing it through, continued growing. You know, yep. when you started writing and you started hearing these artists play your song at the magnitude, how did that make you feel? I was really happy. I remember when Britney Spears was having an interview with Ellen DeGeneres and they talked specifically, they picked my song. Till it's gone. Oh. Yeah. And so I was like, I mean, you know, it, most of the time the artists don't write the song, but they do take credit for saying they wrote it. But I mean, it was nice. It was so awesome to be like, that's the song I wrote that it's on Ellen and she's talking about it. And I just thought, Hey, you know what, this is a way for me to still be happy, still do music. And, um, you know, not have to basically put myself in an uncomfortable situation. As social media started coming out. And, started and in social out. media, yeah. Let's tell, me talk about about that. That. Tell, tell me how much that shifted and changed everything that you were doing. Uh, social media changed everything. Uh, it was now like, oh, I don't have to go through these sleazy a rs or these douchey, you know, men in the business. And you can just put your music out and people can hear it. And But it was still... It's still all political because now it, it it was about money, how much money you can put towards yourself. It wasn't really essentially about the talent. Um, I feel like right now there's so many talented people and they're really pushing hard and they're really consistent that you will finally get a notice. You'll get noticed because now it's it's about the audience. It's like, wow, look at this person. Listen to this person's voice. It's amazing. Share, 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 share. So we have more control and we don't have to give up things. I don't think like I had to back in the nineties and the early two thousands. Yeah. And, 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 and that shift gave more power back to the user. Right. And as a user, you now have the ability to push it out with just all the Victoria's secret song. What do you think about that song? Eh, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Eh, it's good. Talk to it's me good. about it. What do you think about it? Like this is a person who went online and went viral, went from there. Right. She's gonna, yeah. right, But like, that's the crazy side of it, right? Like it's, yeah. it's very, very different, right? And so as it's so different, it's growing from there. The capacity is so different. The audiences are different. It's almost like you have to make those readjustments, right? To, to do yeah. what you have to fit it in. And you've done that because your skits are freaking hilarious, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm a writer. So I was just like, I can write skits. It's not, I, I'm, I'm friends. I was lucky enough and I think I'm blessed enough to be around the right people, the right crew. I ended up being around Jake Hunter and then Jake Hunter introduced me to Adam Wahid and then from there I met King Batch and then you know and then being around and watching them and seeing them I was like this isn't really that hard it's just consistency now it's always about consistency the discipline of consistency and you will get where you need to go if you just keep focusing on that and having and you know and you have to be now multi-talented and I like that because when I, back in the day when I was getting signed, they're like, oh, you don't have to worry about acting or this or that. Now it's like, do it all, be all, you know, cause there's so many different ways to make money and there's so many ways to get yourself out there. So I thought, okay, so my music wasn't really hitting anymore because I got, I was, you know, after a while you get, you get dated. It's the truth, you know? And um, I wasn't signed. And after being, uh, I left ultra, it was like it was a stigma it's like a lot of people don't want to work with me people there was a reputation about me being difficult and i just was like all right well i'll just focus on something else that i'm really good at and the music will come back and it surely slowly has and as you're putting out these skits you know it's funny because the last skit you put up was with one of our mutual friends Corey, right and Corey he was maybe the third fourth or Wait, fifth someone, guest. Uh, hold together. on i'm just gonna some there sorry go on so we'll, we'll let it out put it out there um yeah Corey, Corey is a good friend of ours and you talk about the universe and you talk about how people know each other so yeah you're a small town girl from canada what part of yep. canada i'm from a very small town i mean it's not as small as it used to be i'm from port coquitlam which is about 45 minutes away from vancouver wow so so I'm from a small town. I was, when I was there, it was all farm and blueberry farms. And it was all, I lived by the river. Yeah, it was a pretty small town back then. <laughs> I was, I, we have partners. I was just in Saskatoon. Oh my God. There's yeah. nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> every Canadian, every Canadian says the same thing. About what were you doing out there in Saskatoon? What, what's Saskatoon? the point? There's nothing there. <laughs> 
We go out there. I've been out there three or four times. Love Canada going from there. So small town girl coming from Vancouver gets into this music thing. What did your parents think about that? I have Middle Eastern, you know, I have mixed parents, but their value, core values are very like Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. So was it was difficult, you know? <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, parents are like, yay, you know, she has a record. It was like, oh my God, what are you wearing? I'm like, oh my God, come on. You know, oh, and I, the yeah, Asian, was, the Asian's yeah. coming out. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. Oh, my, mom, yeah. my mom is like, "What is this nonsense?" I'm like, "Mom, I have like a number one record, but what are you evading?" I'm like, "Mom, seriously?" <laughs> so it was like, it's, it, it wasn't it's crazy. Yeah, and my whole side of my dad's side of the family were so rude to my mother, and they're like, "Ah, oh, she's a disgrace to her race," and blah blah blah, and she's disgrace degrading her father's name. I'm like, "What do you mean? It's my name too, and I think I'm fine." You know, and it was just like very old fashioned BS. But, you know, I told my mom, I was like, ignore all that. It's just white noise. Yeah. You know, what's amazing about saying that is a lot of people don't talk about this, but, you know, mixed races, growing up race, things like that. You know, you grew up in Vancouver, a lot of Asian friends, right? South yep. Asian type. The world now is tough, right? You go on the news, you see elderly is getting burned. You get people getting, yep. killed, getting pushed, getting shoved. In places that we know and love, you worry about your mom. I worry about my mom. You yep. see the change in the UK now with the very first prime minister being written. The reaction in 2022. And my whole thing is like, what are you afraid of? Yeah. So what if they come into power, we come to power? We're still people. It, yeah. Do you think we're going to do the same thing to you that you did to us? Because we won't. Because we, did, we, we live that way. We don't want to be like that. Nope. And that's a fear, right? And you see it. And then the other side of the world. Growing up the way we grew up, good grades, doing right, yep. wearing yep. right, trying to explain to our friends why we were weird, but trying to be Americanized or Canadianized enough to where our families weren't going to be on our asses. And yeah, share with you like that too. You get these number one albums, and a lot of people are like, "Oh, my parents had to cheer me on." Let me tell you, these type of families that we come into, they don't know better. No, nope. culturally, it's not there. Culturally, it's like go to school, get a degree, figure it out because. Yeah. They can't fathom how the hell you're making it, not disrespectfully, based on a route that they don't understand. And then yeah, my, yeah, my mom wanted me to be a, a go to school and become a doctor or a lawyer a doctor or, or yeah. an engineer, right? Yep, yep, yep. One of the three, right? And, yep. and 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 then when it doesn't happen, now not only is she feeling it because she's trying to support you, the family's on you, right? And now you're and, being compared to everybody, right? All your friends are there. How did you grow through that and become stronger? Because we have a younger audience, right? How did uh -huh. you find the faith and the love in yourself to get through that initial part? I feel like, you know, that God doesn't give you anything. Or if you don't believe in God, a higher power doesn't give you anything you can't handle. And you just have to understand that it's all just, it's all people's opinions, you know? Sure. And, at, and if you just look at it from a different perspective and say, that's your issue. That's a you issue. That's not a me issue. I'm fine with what I am and who I am and what I do. You know, and so it's basically go F off. Right. You know, I, I literally the best thing advice my my dad ever gave me was like, if anybody is making you feel bad or wrong or awful, X them out. Yeah. Doesn't matter if they're family, doesn't matter if they're blood, doesn't matter if they're if they're not making you feel good and they're treating you like shit for no reason. Like, no. you know, if you know, if you're doing something wrong or bad, I get it. Right. But. But if you're just following your dreams and just wearing a skirt or showing or wearing a bikini and and they're coming at you like that, that's it's just rubbish. It's just plain rubbish. Like move on. Don't be in my life then. And I don't need you in my life. So I cut off a lot of my family members from my father's side. My my you know, and I just and I've kept it that way for years, years. And I will always be like that. If you're gonna come and attack me for the art that I do or my creativity or how I what clothes I wear, then you don't need to be in my my you can be in your box and I'll be in mine. A hundred percent. And and, and yeah. the thing, the hardest part about what you said is the whole entire time you'd wish you could get along and just work. Yep. Their prejudgment is hurting you, and then they're gonna call you the selfish one, the one that doesn't care. But loving yourself and loving your space and respecting yourself is the most important thing. The one thing that I've, I've, I've kind of learned through all this, I have, a, I have a lot of funny stories like that, too. But, you know, being with Katie, you mentioned earlier, one thing she taught me was we don't celebrate, right? So in our culture, mm -hmm. we don't celebrate anything. You know, no one celebrates anything, right? Yeah. 
And the crazy story about it is you started pointing it out. I started realizing as, as I was getting older how important it was. I'd make the news. I'd do the same things, number one. But I wouldn't even celebrate. I wouldn't tell anyone. didn't matter. put online and say anything because no one really celebrated with me. It was part of the way we grew up, right? It was kind of like you can always do better. So I tell my parents one day, like they're stressing me out. And I'm like, listen, this is what I'm doing. I break it all down for them. And I'm like, I've been on Forbes 30 times. My parents are like, I don't know. Wow. Remember. They have no idea what Forbes is. So they fly to Taiwan during the pandemic. So I'm from Taipei, right? That's where I'm yeah. from. They show up. They end up meeting one of their friends. This guy is a guy who's running for mayor of the biggest city there. And the fa- he was he, he's sitting there and he tells my parents, Forbes is a giant deal. Your son's on it. That's really impressive. I want to meet you. That's huge. Me, right? And my parents are like, really? Like, yeah. So then they call me the next day and they tell me it. And it was the same thing you went through. It was almost like I didn't ask you for this validation anymore, not because I didn't want it or I didn't love it, but because I had to learn that the cultural differences and a lot of the kids who are coming in of mixed races and different cultures and even the young guys who are trying to figure out life, we don't know what they know. We don't assume what they assume. They have their restrictions yep. and the things that they have, right? But you guys say mentally strong, and if they cut them out, you have to come in out because well, no matter what they say, it's not real. It's fluff. Yep. Right. The words don't really exist. It, it's not really who you are as a human being unless you act like that on a constant basis and your ability to do that. And that that's not that, that can't be easy for you. Right. It can't be easy for someone of your descent to have to do that and, and talk about during the holidays and feel like the bad guy. When the reality is all you want to do is live your life and be supported by the people you love. Right. Yeah. I mean, I had a song. I wrote a song for Britney Spears. And I'm Damn, telling, telling my, you know, at the time it was a huge for me. And I did a song, a collaboration with Timbaland himself. Ooh. And he was in the music video with me. I got to meet him, you know, and I, I got to meet uh, legends and I'm taking photos with these legends and stuff and showing my family. And to them, it was like, whatever. But you know what? Part of that is really humbling. You got to look at it like in a perspective way. Like if my mom was bit, or if my family was really like, you know, it might have made me have an ego. Right. The same, you know, but because my family was like, whatever, you know, I was like, it humbled me a lot. It was like a part of it was kind of hurtful. But, you know, as a kid, you get hurt. But then when you grow older, you're I was thankful for it because I was like, OK, I'm very humbled by it. You know, it, it's humbling to be like, OK, yeah, there's some people that will give a shit about your co- accomplishments. And there's other people that will be like, oh, well, what's the next big thing that you're going to do? You know, I mean, it, my mom would be more proud of me if I was. Like I said, a doctor or, or, you know, a lawyer or, but, you know, she's coming around now, like after all my songs, after years, and now that I'm not as doing it as, as much as I used to, she's like, why don't you put another song out? <laughs> she's well, as reticent, you know, well, it, it's it, funny. It, you, 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 they, they start to realize it. They start to modernize it. You start to tell your story. You can reinvigorate and react on it. But that emotional journey it's so crazy because you do this, you're pushing it through. Now you're leaving your small town. Now you're going to Hollywood, right? Mm-hmm. And my entering the media, you know, industry, doing the networks that we have, the news channels now that we have, all the things that we're doing. I'm in El Paso and Phoenix for a reason, right? Wow, so we, yeah. We don't want to deal with people that are just bad people. We can do it on our own, figure it out, and go from there, right? And you're coming in and you're doing Hollywood and then you're doing these struggles alone. So you're yes. talking about a good amount of time in your own head mm-hmm. trying to find inner peace and love. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what was the light? What was the aha moment where you're like, fuck this. This is where I got to go. Recenter in peace. And I know you were, I don't need the specifics, but I know you're saying there are these moments, but after these moments in your head, you're like, dude, I'm going to figure this out. And even if it doesn't figure out like you have now, you still have that peace. That's what a lot of people lack, right? That's what we talk about the alcoholism and the drugs and and the sadness and the depression, because when you're crying, you're crying alone. No one sees it. When you're sad, you're crying alone. No one sees it, right? You're feeling, when you're feeling hurt, you're you're, you're feeling by yourself. And after you tell someone, you're still dealing by yourself. So self-love is the only reflection that will maintain your love yourself because no one can give you that love besides you. And you seem to do that. How did you do that? Um, you know what? I was depressed at one moment and I was like, I can't keep being depressed. And then lots of things happened that, you know, helped that push that depression. My father was killed when I was 15. He was also an alcoholic and he was, you know, abusive and all that kind of things being when you were younger, you, and then, 
him dying and then my music, you know, being trapped and not being, it, I was in a, such a dark place. And I guess one day uh, I just decided, I said, either I'm going to go through and become a better person and find another out, or I'm going to basically crash and do the worst to myself. And, and I chose, I remember my father, even though he's been through so much stuff, he told me, you know, you are stronger than me because I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't do anything. And he said, I, you have all the best parts of me. He goes, so don't waste it. Then I remember thinking about that. Like I have a chance to have an amazing life and I, and music doesn't define me. Once you realize your job or whatever you're doing doesn't define you for, and it's not, it, that's not the reason for your happiness. I was waiting for the next single to be happy. And if I wasn't, I didn't have that, I'd be depressed and mad and mean to people. And then I started to do meditation cause I'm from Middle Eastern descent. So I started to go inwards and started to find my roots. And I just start, started to think like, you know what? I could still do music and be happy. I don't have to chase that validation. So it was like a lot of inner peace work. I had to do meditation. I had to figure out, you know, where I want to go. Exercise has saved me. So my vice is working out. I work out a lot. I like to be active. I, I started to find happiness in things that, you know, ne not necessarily had to be the validation from other people. It, it, it's crazy because that journey when you're young and the trauma that you receive, all my listeners know I had a lot of trauma growing up too. You blame yourself. Yep. You're not good enough. Yep. You want to be loved. Absolutely. And all you want to do is give love. Yep. And those are the people that are most compassionate in the world. And this is the hardest thing for me. Being as compassionate as I am, when I get screwed over, when people I love hurt me. Right. I have to realign my chi and yeah. say, this was a journey. This was a path. I was your bridge. You had to do what you had to do. I'm going to continue what I have to do. And the test of time is there. But when you find that self-love, the one that no one ever believed in you, the one that got you through those lonely nights, those sad nights, those crazy nights, when you start to know that your value is based on what you perceive it. And that's why I tell them, I'm in El Paso, right? We're doing all this stuff. We're still in El Paso. We all these great people around the world like yourself then you start feeling freedom. And it's not even an arrogance. It's just being very sure of yourself and saying, I can't do this. I can do this. I can work and go from there. But for the young people, it's a journey. And everybody goes through this. Mm -hmm. And no one talks about it. And that pisses me off that no one talks about it. Because everyone's like, we're so successful. I'm like, bro, that's the highlight reel. But it's not real. It's not it's not. Well, Tell them about the times that you were crying and you were upset and you were depressed. There have been times I was crying myself. I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? I had like midlife crises. Like, every day. You know, every day. And there's Literally ageism for me as a woman. Ageism. Huge thing. Oh, you're in your 30s. Oh, you can't do music anymore. Oh, you're in your 30s. You should stop acting or you should stop. You know, you, you're very immature. For I'm like, you know what? F off. Like, you know, I'm just going to do me and make myself happy. I am. It's not. I'm not perfect. No one is. I'm not going to be like, I hate it when Instagram, Instagram is a real F up for most of people because everybody only posts the good things. No one ever posts the bad stuff. No one does. No one and ever it's does. bad. Yeah, and they, and they should. Do. And they never do. And you're saying it. No one ever talks about it because nobody wants to hear and see it. No one wants to be reminded of it. But the reality is it's the reality and the truth, right? And you're struggling with all these major things that you're going through and everyone just sees you smiling and number one, this number one, that they don't realize I got to figure out how to keep the next number one. Yeah. It is. You'll never figure it out because now you're fighting with your own ego. Now you're fighting with your own validity from a child and saying, Hey man, I was never good. Enough. I'm going to show you world, but that's the wrong way to do. And that's the way the freaking media does it. The right yeah, all way day, do it. all day. It's wrong. It's love. And let me show I can do it. Let me show I can do it the right way. And I don't care if you're ahead of me, I'm going to get to where I need to go. And I don't care what you say about me. I'm going to get where you need to go. And that is the hardest journey that they don't see that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they don't see that. Nobody sees all the bullshit that we go through. Even now I do these skits. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, okay, I hope these do well. I hope I get a couple of hits. I hope I get like more than like 20 all views. Us. All, of, all us. of us. You know, and that's just, it's just what it is. Like we have to, you know, we're entertainers. 
I was born to entertain. That's all I've known my whole life since I was 14 years old and I'm in my 30s now. So it's just like, this is all I know. And yeah, it, and then the body dysmorphia that you have and then like, you know, the depression and then your insecurity levels and your confidence. It's like, you know, it's a long time. I didn't wear, I wore gray contacts because the label kept saying, you cannot look East Indian. You cannot look Middle Eastern. You have to look ambiguous, you know, and it was stupid. And, or, and so for a long time, I didn't show anyone I had brown eyes. Or a long time, nobody knew my last name was like Sharma. Wow. Because I wasn't allowed to say. So they changed wow. it to love. They changed it to Rosette Love or Rosette. But then like they were like, oh, don't put your, when Instagram and stuff started coming up, that's when I put my name like Rosette Love because they're like, you don't want anyone to know your last name. Because if anyone knows you're like East Indian or it's not going to look good for you. That's how it was for me. Sometimes it was like, you look too Indian or you look too dark or even when i go for roles for acting oh you don't look indian enough i'm like i am indian i speak hindi fluently like get off your high yeah, horse yeah that's terrible that's what i went through you know oh my acting they were like oh you're indian i'm like yeah uh no you don't look indian enough i would go and i would and then i would see people in the movies like some dog millionaire i'm like how does she look is any different than me you know uh, I would always have to play, I'd get roles where I was like half black or Puerto Rican or this, but if I was going to play an East Indian role, I'd have to have the East Indian accent, you know? So I started to take these things and then I started making fun of them in skits. Like again, like Jay Country, I was like, why don't I do an East Indian skit? People will find it funnier if I have my East Indian accent, which by the way, I had growing up because I couldn't speak English when I was a kid. Yeah, so, that, that must have been hard too because I know that story. That was not fun either. Yeah. You know how that is. You can't speak English. Everybody's making parents fun of you. Parents can't help you. They nope. make you your R's. Or they can't even say their R's. My parents can't nope. say their L's, right? It's terrible. Yep. You're trying to yep. say it. It's terrible. I smell like curry. I come from a house that eats curry. What do you want? You know, Why like, am I kicking off my shoes? I'm like, dude, it just is what it is. It is what it is. My lunches smelled really delicious to me, but like everybody else. It was dude, like, lunch, no. was lunch was hard. Lunch was hard. <laughs> lunch hard, was man. so hard. Lunch was hard yeah. for an Asian kid, man. It, was, it wasn't fun like growing up. You and like, me both. What's the I was, all my like, friends were Asian. All my friends were Asian in the Middle East in, high, in like elementary because we all smelt the same. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's what's funny about the comedy now? You talk about that, right? You talk about the last skit. And I, I went back to that originally. People don't really believe, and I started to believe this more and more as we've gotten older and more secure and my cheese aligned and things are going from there. We met through Shelby. And what's funny about that whole story is the Shelby's such a great person. You know, Amazing. I love and her. The reason that was so cool was because how we, we met her – I was in the middle of another project that went horribly wrong. Oh. And Shelby was part of new people that knew me that were part of that crew. And Shelby not once ever judged or predetermined or acted a certain way. She always just accepted you for you. And I knew yes. that, that was a friendship that I wanted to have because that's how I am as a person. And mm -hmm. we became friends. And then I meet you, right? And I meet you randomly in 19, the pandemic happens. Right, right when the pandemic happens, you're out in LA. Shelby's in Austin. I'm in El in, in El Paso. Right, so I meet her. We're in LA. Meet there through there. A year goes around, and then I go to Bali with Katie. We're doing the shoot, and we meet Corey. Corey, we. We met Corey. We met her in Bali, and she starts. Wow. Meeting, we're like, we have mutual friends, and we start talking, la la. And then she comes back. A couple months pass by, and now she starts running into Jalen and Rodney. And, wow. and, and and Good Burger Ed, who are all part of our gaming thing. And then I'm like, what the heck? And then I look online, and it's you on the next skit. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? How is it that all these people that are good people, they're good people, have yeah. put together, and me, me, and Bali stay in touch through the good side of social media, and then seeing the mutual friends, and then reenacting, reinvigorating these friendships, and talking about, and seeing the people you're around with, because people around with, especially in the area you're at, they're good yeah. people, and they they don't mess with bad people. So it's only no. validation that's coming in very quickly, and that just goes show how the world works. It yep. doesn't matter how how ahead they they're getting. It doesn't matter if they're making the first five years and ten years. Life is a freaking marathon, and you and I both know it only works by good people telling other good people how good they are. I, I like attracts like 
I, I met Corey through my friend Vinny and Vinny was like, oh, Corey's amazing. And then I kind of started following her and we kind of lost touch. And then she started working with Jake Hunter, uh, who I did a lot of my, he's my brother skit. Um, and then again, I just decided, and then she started seeing a friend of mine that goes to the mutual gym that I go to. <laughs> I was like, and I'm like, wait, you're dating Corey? I met Corey. And he goes, oh yeah, she's amazing. And then finally, I was just like, Corey, do you want to do some skits? I have so many ideas and you would be perfect because you're super hot and I want to be the funny, not hot girl because it works because it's relatable. Not everyone can look like you, Corey, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, and she was down for it. She was, and that's what makes her so amazing because she can make fun of herself. She's funny. She's talented. She's super smart. She's a businesswoman. You know, it's nice to be around people like that. And it's nice to be able to be with friends with people that you can also be creative with. It's like a win-win. We soon found out that Corey grew up an hour and a half away from where, where I'm at. No way. That's the other crazier part. And, and I mean an hour and a half. I mean, you know, you talk about these small cities. That's like the next next city over, right? That's how small this yeah. is. And so, you know, she would come to my city when she was a kid growing up. And that's how small this world is. And that's to let everyone know that, like, although through this journey and through this path and – it's shitty, the things we have to yeah. go through. It, yeah. it, it is hard. Like, everybody wants to be loved and everyone wants to be respected, but everyone doesn't know how to love and respect themselves and give that love and respect to other people, right? No. And so no. now we're stuck in this dilemma where we're trying to figure it out and, and really, really try to make it work. And so through the empowerment of good things and great people that are working together, you start collaborating on things because there are no ill, Ill intentions, right? It's just like, hey, let me start. No. Was like, Corey was like, yo, you got to pay me money. It was like, all right, cool. Let's make it happen, right? It's just like that. That's how people support each other. That's how people are real. And do you find that happening more and more with this generation as opposed to the previous generation? I do think this generation is more open. However, I also feel this generation um, is also very, uh, has a lot of ego sometimes because, you know, Corey's amazing. But there's some people that I have met that have like millions of followers and stuff. And, and if I don't have the certain, same amount of right? status, they won't even like talk to me. And it's just like, really? Because what if it's, you know, but whereas in Corey, she's, well, she has so much success, you know, she doesn't have to work with me, but she chooses to, she doesn't care about that stuff. She cares about the creative, you know, juices flowing and look at her. She's, and she looks amazing in it and it's fun. You know, I like people like that, but I live in LA and I have no family here. I'm by myself, you know, and um, yeah, I've been to a lot of influencer parties and, you know, I've bumped into a lot of people that have a lot of followers and, you know, as soon as they, but as soon as they see that I'm verified and everything, they wonder why. They're like, oh, why are you verified on everything? How do I get verified? I was like, I don't know. You got to be good at something. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and I've never, you know, I could be like that too. Like I have videos with millions of views, like way before all this IG stuff happened. That was fucking hard. Sorry. Excuse right, my friend. Right, right. They're like, imagine doing that with no IG and, and that's what I achieved. But do I turn around and like, be like, you know what? I could be just like you, but I'm not. And that, you know what? It's good. It's good that people are like that. Cause then you can, you know, weed out the good people and keep, you know I mean? Weed out the bad people and keep the good. So that's why like attracts like. And I think Corey is amazing, Christian, anyone, you know, but there are people that are like, oh, how many followers you have? Oh, yeah, you're not going to do much for me, so I'm not going to work with you. Or I had like a friend once who I thought was a good friend of mine, you know, ended up blowing up, started getting a lot of followers. And I asked her, hey, could you post like promote my can you just repost my song? Nah, I don't like your song. I'm not going to do it. What? Yeah. Yeah. But like, meanwhile, you know, she would repost someone else's song that's total crap just because that person had like way more followers than her so i've been through it i've been through it you know and and you know this was someone i spent so much time with too and like you know or my birthday passed not one repost of us together but like if someone else who's like super famous full on so it still happens i think the younger generation is um they're all i think i feel bad for them because a they grew up with like social media so it's a lot more pressure on them but I think some of them will go through it and become stronger. And it's not about the validation. It's just about the pure art form and creativity, which I hope most people can get through. I feel more for the women because there's so much pressure to look amazing. And that's why I post some of the videos I post. 
where it's like, I don't have a six pack. I do have a little belly because that's normal, you know? And I like that this, there is a portion of younger people that are very body positive And I like that, but you know, essentially, I don't really think Instagram pushes that like it should, like everybody I scroll through is like super hot and perfect. And I'm like, that's a lot of pressure for like a 13 year old or a 12 year old or an 18 year old, you know? So I thought with Corey, let's do something that shows a little bit more realism. Yeah, and and, and 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 it came through, right? The yeah. realism because we're we're now sitting here with a bunch of people who are concerned about likes and followers and which platform to go on and going from there and like there's like so many of them, right? And you're just trying to keep up. But to me, it's just a big marketing scam. All of it. It's a big fucking marketing scam. It's like buy my product, here's how many people I have. You go look on, you can buy half the freaking followers that they have anyways, you can buy half the likes. Let me go validate stuff. And I'm like, bro, we've done IPOs and there's not a validation there, right? And it's not the short-term things. It's the long-term things that we're doing. And so the younger audience, like you're saying, is helping each other is a big deal because you never know when that person's going to be blowing up or when you need them or the behind the scenes. You have no idea what's going on. So yeah. why are you rude to people? Why, why? If you could be nice and have less people hate you out there, it's hard to be a jerk to someone who's nice. And if you're being a jerk to someone nice, you're just a jerk. Yep. Right. Yep. It doesn't mean that you're less aggressive in business. It doesn't mean that you don't know what you're thinking. It just shows how comfortable you are in your positions. Right. We walk into rooms with these guys, I pull the guys, all this and that and that and this. And he's, and I'm like, dude, me and my family have been over 12 years. They're like, what? Yeah. yeah, we've been here 12 years. Like, oh, wow. You know, we do this, we do this. And it's like, we don't even, you know, you mess. We don't, we don't come in. I mean, in, in an unassuming amount, we're just, we're just, this is who we are. This is what we have to yeah. do. Yeah. And that's the way I think a lot of people when they're trying to figure out their career, they do like that those two paths, right? Or three paths. It's like let me be dark and gritty and sad, but then mentally it it fucks them up. Yeah. Right. And yep. but that's that's the that's the brand I'm gonna push out. The one is yeah. I'll do cheerful and go from there and do what I have to do. Listen to what you have to do. The second one, that's the second brand, right? And the third one is following your true path and what you want to do, which is the thing that you've done, but all three have positives and negatives. And the kids are out there trying to find it with themselves. Just be fucking you. Just, just be, be you. You don't need just to be, be you. Outside you because you're going to fall into security because you love yourself. You're going to, doesn't matter if you're nobody from nowhere. I say this everyone. I'm like, I mean, nobody from nowhere that's becoming a somebody from somewhere. I go, do you know what it's like to sit in a room with someone who went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and, and smart people? And I am a college dropout and I am going toe to toe with them on business. It takes, Walking in that room, you gotta know you're the you're the biggest person. But how do you develop that if you have no self esteem from where you came from? And it's, it's all from in. It's all confidence. A hundred percent. You know, it, like, it, it's it's crazy. No, absolutely. Like a lot of people are like, "Oh, Rizal, you're gonna put yourself with no makeup on." I'm like, "Yeah, I don't care." And I'll even show people like, "Here's me with a filter. Here's me with no filter." Like self love. You know, I, I agree with you. Just be you. I started just being me on my Instagram. I would just do funny things. I can be sexy. I can be goofy. I can be just be you. And don't give a two shits about what anybody else thinks because there's going to be a plethora of other people that will love you. Just, and the liberation you. that you felt from that is amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't care now what I, I mean, you know, like there's some certain things that, you know, I just keep to myself, but most of the time I'm me. Everything on Instagram is authentically me. Like I talk about me, everything, all those skits are skits that I've come up with, with Corey, you know, like it's just me. It's just fun stuff. And if it hits, it hits. And if it doesn't try again, pick up right. yourself and try again. Try again. That's right. That's try again. Keep trying until they can stop. You know, I appreciate all your time talking to me today. Tell us where they can find you on social media and all your handles. Okay, yeah. So Instagram, it's Rosette, L U V E, like Rosette Love. And um, it's, uh, what you call uh, YouTube, it's again Rosette, L U V E. Uh, yeah, I think TikTok, Rosette underscore Love, L U V E. Uh, I guess it's mostly Rosette Love. My Facebook is Rosette Love or Rosette Official. It's my page. And Twitter again, Rosette Love. So there you can find me come say find, hi I, I actually comment on everybody <laughs> find Rosette love on social media i want to talk about one last thing i just i thought about this working with Brittany. yes 
Top story. Top show. Yes. Tell me about this. She's amazing. How did it happen? Like the process. Like you wrote for Britney Spears, the number one hit. It was talking about Ellen. Like talk to us about this. That, that's what I really want to talk about. Tell me about the Britney Spears. How you did it? How you got it together? How you did the whole thing? Like how did that work? Well, so I wrote it with a friend of mine, and him. Him and I were both signed to Ultra Records, except he was a full blown songwriter. So he was writing a lot, and he goes, "You know what? Um, uh, we showed it to Will I Am." Uh, and he really likes it. So I'm really good friends with Mike Daddy Evans, who's friends with uh, Venus Brown and all these people. And like, so it was all interconnected through the music at that time. And uh, I guess Will I Am or somebody from the publishing company played it for her and she loved it. And we got a, we, we ended up getting a couple messages back. I'm sorry, saying, Will I Am? The Will I Am and David, I think. Yeah, someone will I am. That's not a dope story. It. That's a dope story. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't even know. Like, I was, like, oblivious to it all. I was like, oh, I thought it was going to come out for me. I was like, oh, this is a great song. Let's put it out. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Meanwhile, he went and he was like, yeah, I'm going to submit it. And so we submitted it. It was, like, David Guetta was, I think David Guetta was on it. And Will I Am is on it. And Britney Spears is on it. And it was, it was just, like basically through the channels of ultra records and the people we knew and the people my friend knew we boom and within like two weeks they re they cut it i didn't know they even cut the song i found out when the song was already done and i was like what i thought i was putting the song out wow <laughs> all right yeah and then boom it was on her britney jeans album and uh yeah it did well i got a gold plaque from it let's go very happy yeah i got so many plaques at home at my mom's house and she doesn't even know what to do with them <laughs> she goes that doesn't pay the rent. i love she it goes, I... she goes it doesn't pay the rent i'm like mom <laughs> it's it really hard to get <laughs> you're like it's not everything about money asian parents it's about yeah everything. hello <laughs> she goes what does this prove it's just getting dust i'm like mom not everyone can get a plaque you know that's got that's got to be a tough one I, I love that you do that with comedy i i'm really grateful that you shared that story what an amazing story and yeah. and to do that with britney submit it and get those and it pays a rent or and you know you know and it's it, it's that legacy right no one in this world will ever will take that from you you've got that no. I, I i appreciate it i appreciate the time thank you so much thank you we appreciate you so much as well thank, thank you. you for joining us for david chen and rosette love we thank you guys for your time for New York Weekly's number one podcast, Pandanomics. We'll see you guys next week. Good night.